Okay, how is fat produced? Keep in mind that in terms of fat, we rarely produce our own fat, like, a, like an industry doesn't produce it, right? Saturated fats usually coming from animal fat. Uh, po uh, unsaturated fats usually from plants, right? Like olive oil, uh, peanut oil, those are all unsaturated fats. Now, polyunsaturated fats or trans fats are going to be fats that we use that we kind of have something like a, you know, like a saturated fat, and then we modify it a little bit. Those are the ones that have been kind of outlawed. Now let's talk about chapter three. In chapter three, we're gonna talk about just cell biology and, and genetics a little bit. We're not gonna get into genetics until next week. Like that starts towards the end. For your quiz, you need to know up until this part of it, right? So you need to know the types of, in a second, types of uh, cell engulfing. You need to know the organelles, that kind of stuff you need to know. I do have videos on that as well. And uh, hopefully we'll get to that pretty quickly as well. So most of you guys have heard of some of these organelles, right? Microvilli, flagella, cilia, right? Most of you guys have heard of this one, mitochondria. Most everybody might've heard of Golgi. Everybody should have heard of nucleus and cytoplasm. So those you guys should have heard of before in some of your biology classes. So we'll just go through these in a little bit more detail in our class. So let's talk about the basic structure of a cell. Now, when you take a look at this structure right here, keep in mind that this kind of look right here, this is the actual protein. That's a protein channel, right? What else do we see? You see this kind of red looking, it looks like little ants in structure right here. You take a look at it. This actually is our phospholipid bilayer, right? You have that head region in red facing outwards. This is water on outside of the cell, water on the inside of the cell. Because there's water on both sides, the head region that's polar, head region of our phospholipid faces water on one side. And then the other side, there's water on the inside too. So you have the head polar region also facing water on the inside. Because they face water on each side, you have two layers of this phospholipid. That's why we call it the phospholipid bilayer. Now, the tails are what we see kind of facing each other on the inside right here. So remember, a phospholipid has a polar head, nonpolar tails. The polar head likes to react with other polar molecules. Water, very polar. So it likes to react with water here and then water on the inside as well. The nonpolar tails want to get away from water. What's the easiest they can, way they can get away from water is facing inwards in both directions. That's why the tails face medially like this. And then the heads face outwards on each side right here. This is a phospholipid bilayer. Now, should we ever see this type of cell completely? Never, <clears throat> All right? This cell is a composite cell. You'll either see cells with microvilli or you'll see cells with cilia. You're not gonna have cells with both. Now, the rest of the cell is very good, right? You'll see Golgi in every cell, right? You'll see mitochondria, nucleus, right? You'll see peroxisomes and lysosomes. You'll see centrioles in just about every group of cells except for red blood cells. Red blood cells do not have any of this right here. Red blood cells only have cytoplasm for hemoglobin and that's it. So the sole purpose of red blood cells is to just carry oxygen, right? They don't have Golgi, they don't have a nucleus, they don't have rough and smooth endoplasmic reticulum, they don't even have mitochondria. Right, because of that, they don't, you know, they're once they're damaged, they can't heal. They're not very energetic. And the good news is, right, you're gonna make two million red blood cells every second. That means you get rid of two million every second. You don't need the red blood cells to heal itself. Once it's damaged, right, we get it out of circulation. There's another two million more coming, right? 
So let's discuss then, oops, in terms of the functions of the cell. Each cell is very important in terms of the cell metabolism and energy use. Now each cell is gonna be different in terms of what its function is. You can have clusters of cell in the liver, gonna be different than the clusters of cell in the spinal cord, right? They all though have some kind of metabolic cell needs and energy uses. They're gonna be able to produce molecules. That molecule can be a hormone. It can be a neurotransmitter for other cells to use. Cells need to communicate with each other. So the cells need to produce and receive some kind of electrical and or chemical signals. Some cells are gonna be very important for reproduction and inheritance, right? Now, each cell of the body contains DNA except red blood cells. Again, red blood cells doesn't have any organelles. Some cells are specialized to the gametes for exchange of of uh, genetic material during sexual intercourse. And we'll talk more about you know, sexual reproduction next semester, but keep in mind, right? We have 46 chromosomes, 46 double strands of DNA. Does that mean we have 46 different chromosomes? Not really, right? In reality is we have 23 different chromosomes. We have one set of 23 chromosomes from our mom one set of 23 from our dad. We have two sets of 23 chromosomes. We inherit one each from our parent. That's how we get 46. What do I mean, All right? If we look at chromosome number one from mom, chromosome number one from dad, they will code for similar proteins, not in an identical way because your mom and dad are not identical twins, but they will code. So if I look at a specific part of chromosome one from dad, look at a specific part of chromosome one for mom, they will code for a similar protein, maybe for melanin, for the hair. But since your mom is blonde hair, right, you're gonna have the recessive melanin trait. Dad is dark hair, he's gonna have the dominant brown or black hair trait. In other words, they both code for melanin, they just code in a different variant, right? That's what we mean from chromosome one and we compare it to the other chromosome one two sets of 23 chromosomes, not 46 different chromosomes. That's a big kind of difference, right? Now, the plasma membrane separates intracellular versus extracellular material. And when you take a look right here, here's the phospholipid bilayer, two layers. You'll see the head region facing fluid on one side, head region facing fluid on the inside. Now, because this is made out of fats right here, only fat-soluble material can get right through. Fat-soluble material like other fats, right? Triglycerides can go from the outside of the cell inwards really easily because it's a fat. Gases, oxygen, carbon dioxide, oxygen can go right through the cell. Why? Because it's fat-soluble. Carbon dioxide produced by the cell can go in the opposite direction because it's fat soluble. So fat soluble materials can get in and out really easily. Everything else requires help right here. So it acts as a physical barrier for everything other than nonpolar fats and gases. Everything else needs help. Sodium, potassium, calcium, right? Those ions can't get through unless there's a receptor. Right? What else? Glucose can't get through unless there's a glucose receptor. Amino acids can't get through unless there's a receptor for the amino acid. In other words, the only things that can go from one side to the other without any help, right? Only thing are gases and fats, cholesterol, testosterone. We know testosterone and anabolic steroids build muscle, right? Why? Because they get through the plasma membrane of your skeletal muscles. They go into the nucleus immediately without needing any extra help. And then because it's a fat, get through the nucleus. The nucleus has its own membrane made out of fat. And then it can trigger protein synthesis in your skeletal muscle, giving you protein addition to the skeletal muscles, making the muscle grow in size. Perfect, that's why it works so well. Now. What else does the plasma membrane do? 
production of charge differences between the charge difference between the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. We call that charge difference a membrane potential, right? And we'll talk more about that. That becomes really important later on. Then we see all these little yellow things sticking out. These are the glycocalyx, combination of carbon, carbon dioxide, uh, carbohydrates and fats. We call that a glycolipid. So anytime you hear the word glyco, think sugar. Glycoproteins are sugars and proteins. What they form is our own way of signaling that this cell is part of our body, right? Do not attack this cell. This cell has all the markers that makes it part of our body. When it has all the markers, the white blood cell then reads the markers, figures out this cell is part of the body. It doesn't attack it. When you have somebody donate an organ to you, or you donate an organ to somebody else, right? Everybody has different markers sticking out of all of their cells, except identical twins. Now, when they have these markers sticking out right here, if you don't happen to have an identical twin, most of us don't, and you need even a fraternal twin or a brother to help you and give you a, you know, a, a kidney later in life, what happens is, even if it's a relative, these glycocalyx markers are different in them than in you. So when white blood cells go to that area, it notices that difference. Your white blood cells will start attacking that donated organ that gives us our right, transplant rejections. So these are incredibly important cell signalers that tells us that this cell is part of our larger body. And that tells us that number one, right? Don't attack it. And number two, if there's a mutation in this, right, then it makes it okay for that white blood cell to kill that mutated cell, right? Now, phospholipids, polar heads face water. We kind of mentioned that. Tails face inwards because they want to get away from water. They're hydrophobic. Cholesterol, interspersed among phospholipids. It, um, the amount of cholesterol determines the fluid nature, fluid nature of our plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is supposed to be like a sea of oil, right? A sea of oil, that's all, not solid fat like lard, but a sea of oil with a little bit of protein that's inside of it. The cholesterol makes it more solid in the nature, more, right, structurally intact, or more structurally intact, right? You can imagine if it's just oil, it just move around too much, right? By adding cholesterol, you make it more solid. Perfect then. Now what else? Again, now in order for most things to get through and do its job, we need proteins on there. Remember, only fat soluble fats and vitamins, only fat soluble gases can get through. Everything else, needs help to get into your cell, all right? We know we need glucose for energy. We need amino acids to make proteins, right? We need sugars as well to make ATP. How do they get in? Well, they get in through proteins, membrane proteins, right? These proteins allow us to bring things in and out of the cell. Now, before we talk about the proteins, which are easy to kind of remember, I want us to talk a little bit about how things get in and out which means we're gonna talk about diffusion and osmosis, right? So I'm just gonna skip ahead, make sure we talk about this. What is diffusion? You guys have heard of this term before probably. Diffusion occurs when there's a concentration gradient between one area to the next. Now they use this example of putting, right? A block of salt into pure distilled water. So the distilled water has no actual contaminants in it. It's just water. Distilled water is what happens when you boil water and then you catch the water droplets, right? The water droplets after you boil it should be free of any metals, any vitamins, any minerals. It's just H2O, that's distilled water. So when you add sugar to it or salt in this example, that salt crystal 
is very concentrated with salt. The salt wants to go from an area of high salt concentration to area of lower salt concentration. The water has no salt. It's just pure H2O. So the water, right? You go from high solute, the, sugar, the salt crystal, and the salt crystal dissolves and starts to spread out. As it spreads out, it spreads out from high concentrations to low concentrations. That's the fusion. The fusion is the movement of any solute from higher solute concentrations to lower solute concentrations. Eventually, right, when it moves via there from high to low, we say they're moving down their concentration gradient. Gradient means difference, right? Eventually, you have these ions in equilibrium, right? So eventually, we're going to hit equilibrium. And now when it hits equilibrium, everything, if I take the concentration of solute in this corner, it should be very similar to the concentration of solute in this side and down here even. Everything should be in equal concentrations at equilibrium. Perfect. Now, I don't like using this example because, right, it's hard to just picture it. In my in-class lectures, I use what happens when you have, right, two beakers. One beaker has high amounts of salt. The other beaker has just pure water, right? And then we connect the beaker. As we connect the two beakers, well, the beaker with high salt that salt moves from the higher concentration to the other beaker where there's no salt in it, right? That's easier to picture than this. So review my in-class, right, notes for diffusion, right? So in terms of understanding it, this is an, in a simple way, in like a one sentence way, probably the easiest way to understand it is diffusion is a movement of solute from area of high solute concentration to area of lower solute concentration in a solution. So when you go from high concentration to low concentration, that's a fusion, no energy is required. It's only when you go in reverse that you need energy, right? So just keep in mind that when we talk about diffusion and everything, right? That diffusion is the movement of any solute from high to low. For some reason, that thing came up. Uh, right, so next, right here in our body, very few things actually have diffusion, simple diffusion, right? Remember, in our body, we don't just have two beakers connected to each other, uh, connected to each other, right? We have cells, cells with phospholipid bilayers right here. Now, the only things that can diffuse right through, through and pass a phospholipid layer by layer are gases and fats. Lipid soluble molecules, testosterone, estrogen, cholesterol, triglycerides, those are all lipids, right? Even our vitamin D, E, K, and A. Those lipid soluble molecules, they're made out of fats. They can go from outside inwards. They can also go in reverse. The only reason that these lipid soluble molecules, right, the five droplets in yellow, you see the arrow going inwards? Why? Is because there's more of it on the outside, right? There's five droplets on the outside, four on the inside. There's a concentration gradient. When there's more on the outside, the lipid then will go from outside in without help. This is simple diffusion, right? That only happens with oxygen, carbon dioxide gases, all gases in general, and lipid soluble molecules. Everything else, right? Sodium, potassium, glucose, amino acids, right? Those are non-lipid soluble molecules. Notice what happens. You have a lot of, right, glucose here. You have very little glucose in the cell. Glucose wants to go from high concentration to low concentration. But 
because it's non-lipid soluble, it can't just go right through. It can't undergo simple diffusion. What does it do then, right? In order for the sugar, the glucose to enter the cell, you need a specific receptor for it. If we had a glucose receptor, then glucose will go from the outside in through the receptor inwards, right? And these glucose molecules would just rush inwards. Now, they don't show that here. Instead, they show the pink droplets here. That's supposed to be sodium, right? Sodium is also very similar to glucose in that they're non-lipid soluble. In other words, they can't just go through the plasma membrane from high concentrations to low, right? There's a lot more of the pink or red, right? Sodium ions on the outside than on the inside, right? So now there's a concentration gradient. Glucose wanted to go in, no receptor, it's stuck out here. Sodium wants to come in, but now there's a receptor for sodium. As a receptor opens up, sodium goes from high concentration on the outside to low concentrations on the inside, All right? Sodium rushes inwards. We call that facilitated diffusion. The protein is a membrane channel that facilitates, helps the movement of sodium from outside inwards. If this protein was closed, right? If there's a block on it, and usually there is a block on it, right? If there's a block on it, you have the lots of sodium on the outside, very little on the inside. But with the block in place, sodium can't move through. When the block is removed, sodium moves through and we have facilitated diffusion. Perfect. By the way, when you give somebody insulin, when they have type one or type two diabetes, when you give somebody insulin, you add more glucose receptors to every cell in their body. Because there's more glucose receptors, all the glucose that is stuck in your blood then enters your cells. As a glucose enters your cells, there's lead, less blood glucose, and your blood glucose level starts to go down and dip to normal levels. That's why insulin is important because it adds glucose receptors to every cell of your body, allowing the glucose to go into the cell. Now it's no longer stuck in your bloodstream. All right, so that's simple and facilitated diffusion. What is osmosis? Osmosis is the movement of water from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration across a selectively permeable membrane, right? So you need a membrane in a way. In our body, we have a membrane, right? Sometimes we call it a semi-permeable membrane, sometimes a selectively permeable membrane. Doesn't really matter, right? Now, this membrane that we're talking about right here, oops, this membrane, right, usually is going to be the plasma membrane, right? Now, water can get in and out of our cells pretty easily, really easily. And what happens with water is this, and I'm using this one because you can show like the red blood cells here. What happens, right, if I put red blood cells right here, and the red blood cells in the inside has lots and lots of protein, has lots of salts, right? The amount of salt and protein equals about 300 milligrams per deciliter. So that's a milliosmos per de deciliter. What happens if we put this red blood cell with all the protein, all the salt inside of it, and then I put it in to isotonic fluid a fluid that has similar solutes, nothing, right? Because there's the same amount of salts and solutes in the solution, it's isotonic, right? Isotonic means it's identical. So we have very similar salt, identical salt and solute concentration in the solution as inside the red blood cell. Because we're already in equilibrium, you'll have the same amount of water going out as going in. 
to the cell. Perfect. By the way, this is a reason why if you are dehydrated and you go into the ER, do they give you a gallon of water and tell you to drink that water? No, right? They give you fluids, a 2% saline kind of solution. Why? It's because of this. By giving saline, I'm giving you an isotonic solution that matches the solutes inside the red blood cell. Because it matches, that fluid I'm giving you doesn't go into the cells. It stays outside, right? Stays in your plasma, outside of your red blood cells. That's exactly where we want it. We don't want, right? that fluid to go into the red blood cells. That's not good, right? That happens when we drink pure water. Now, have you heard about, you guys are all pretty young now, but you know, about 10 years ago, the Nintendo Wii was the most popular craze in the world. Nobody could find the Nintendo Wii. And I know you're probably wondering why in the world is Dr. Lee talking about Nintendo Wii, right? The reason is this, it was so obscenely hard to get people would line up for hours just for a chance to get it. So people line up at two, three o'clock in the morning on the off chance that Best Buy would have two, three, right? Of the actual Nintendo Wii's. So they try to get there real early. Usually people still had a hard time getting it. In this environment in California, there's a radio station that had a radio contest. Hold your Wii for a Nintendo Wii. Sounds great, doesn't it? All right? The actual basis of the contest was this. You hold your urine for as long as possible. You drink two gallons of water and you hold it. Whoever holds it the longest wins the Nintendo Wii. That's all it was for, a Nintendo Wii, right? But because they had no knowledge of science, water is good for you, right? It shouldn't cause harm. What happened? Well, what happened is this. When you drink pure water, you're introducing a hypotonic solution into your body. And when you drink two gallons of water, you're introducing pure water, right? And what happens when you have pure water and now you put it right into your bloodstream where you see red blood cells? This condition happens. When you give somebody pure water, water in your plasma, right? Wants to go to an area of higher solute concentration. Think about it. I have plasma in your body, right? It's got a certain amount of salts. What happens if I keep adding water? I keep diluting, right? The salt concentration. Just like if you're mixing Gatorade, right? What happens if you put too much water, right? Or you're making coffee. Instead of adding the proper amount of water, you add too much water. It becomes dilute. That's what happens when you drink pure water. When you drink pure water, two gallons of it, it goes into your bloodstream and it dilutes your plasma. Normally your plasma, right, has the same amount of solute as the red blood cells that's being carried by the plasma, right? So you have 300 milli osmoles of solutes in the red blood cell. The plasma, the fluid part of whole blood surrounds the red blood cell. It is also at 300 milli osmoles. We're in equilibrium. No water moves in and out, right? Here, I'm adding so much water because she just ingested two gallons of it. It goes right into your bloodstream. And what happens? Your plasma concentration of salt starts to go down. Now, your plasma has less solute than inside all the cells. Water goes from your plasma through our semi permeable plasma membrane. And now water goes in and it causes the cells to swell up and then burst. At first, the woman would have very big edema in the legs as water goes into the cells and the cells of the body starts to increase in size because of the water, right? And she'll be edematous. Eventually, she had cerebral edema and she herniated her brainstem. The woman that won the Nintendo Wii lost her life because of water toxicity. If she would have let herself urinate, 
she would have gotten rid of that excess water, right? Because she didn't, that excess water stayed in the bloodstream, right? And now water always moves to higher solute concentration. It goes into the red blood cells. It goes out of the blood vessel itself. As it goes out of the blood vessel, it goes into areas of your body where interstitial fluid are. So in your legs, there's room for it to swell. In your brain, there isn't, right? And you started herniating the brainstem. She had seizures. They did everything they could to save her life, but she eventually herniated her brainstem and died as a response. That's why you shouldn't drink. That's why if you go to ER, they don't just give you pure water to drink. Now, what happened if you are given hypertonic solution, right? Now with hypertonic solution, there's more salts than there should be in the plasma. Because there's more salt in the plasma, water from your cells is drawn to that high solute concentration in plasma. The water inside the red blood cells starts to leak out, causing the cells to shrink or crenate, not cremate, but crenate. Cell shrinks, loses integrity, and dies. This is what happens if you drink salt water, right? You've all heard of drinking, you know, you shouldn't drink seawater, even if you're desperate, right? Some people don't even think about going into the sea, right? Going onto a boat because they're so scared of being stranded. Why? Because even though you have so much water, it's all salt water. That seawater has too much salt in it. When you drink it, it causes your plasma to also be increased solute concentration. Now you have high solute in the plasma surrounding the red blood cells. The water in the red blood cells leaks out of the cell, causing the cells to shrink and then die. That's creation, creation. Again, Osmosis occurs because there's a membrane in the way. If we didn't have this membrane, right, what happens? There's going to be just diffusion, right? If there is no semi permeable membrane, diffusion would occur. All the salts out here or in here in for hypertonic, there's a lot more salt in the plasma, right? Then all that salt would just go into the cell if there's no plasma membrane. Right? But because there's a plasma membrane in all of our cells, it limits the salt movement. So only water will move. Osmosis occurs through a semi-permeable membrane from low solute to higher solute concentrations. So keep that in mind, know the difference, right? In terms of that. Now we can, in terms of diffusion, we can go against a concentration gradient. Meaning what? In our body, we will see in our cells. All right, this is sodium. There's a lot of sodium on the outside. Usually, I'll give you a number, right? There's about 140 milli equivalents of sodium on the outside. Usually only 12 milli equivalents of sodium on the inside. So that's a huge concentration difference, right? 140. 12, right? Now, in our body, we still want to make this 12 even lower. So what we're going to do is take some of the salts, some of the sodium that gets in and pump it out. When we pump it out, we're going against the concentration gradient. As we go against the concentration gradient, the concentration gradient says we want to, sodium wants to go in. But in our cells, we want to also have it go in reverse. When we're going against a concentration gradient, it's like swimming upstream. Have you guys ever, or even better, have you ever rode your bike downhill? Easy, right? You actually have to press on the brakes so then you don't go too fast. That's diffusion. Diffusion is going downhill, going from high to low, to going downhill. Have you ever going? gone uphill? Well, if you're going downhill, you have to go uphill eventually, right? So what happens? When you're going uphill, you're going against the concentration gradient. In order to do that, you're going to have to put in a lot more effort to climb uphill, don't you? Right? Why? Because you're going against that concentration grade, right? 
And what happens? You're going against a slope in our body. We're going against a concentration gradient. Going against a concentration gradient requires energy, requires ATP. So when you see that you have an ATP pump and you will read about it and you'll watch the videos on it, right? When we have an ATP powered pump, sodium potassium pump is an ATP pump, right? That pump requires ATP because you're taking three sodiums here and you're gonna pump it out. And because you're going against a concentration gradient for sodium, you will require a lot of energy. For the sodium potassium pump, even potassium is going against the concentration gradient. So for you take three sodium from the inside and pump it out. That's going against a concentration gradient for sodium. Same thing for potassium. You take potassium from the outside and pump it in. What are we gonna see? Your potassium concentration is gonna be very high on the inside, very low potassium on the outside. So by pumping it in, you're going against a concentration gradient for potassium as well. That's why it requires so much energy to run our sodium potassium pumps. All right, so all right, review all these different type of proteins. Proteins can act as, and we kind of mentioned this, right? They can act as marker proteins. That's your glycoprotein, glycocalyx. Those proteins are cell are for cell communication to identify your cells versus other people's cells or other microbes, right? So the glycoproteins are important for immunity and cell identity and cell recognition. What else? Proteins can allow your cells to attach to the underlying basement membrane, the underlying foundation. That's what we see here, right? The cells are going to need to be attached to the tissue that it's supposed to be covering. These cadherins allow us to attach to other cells. Integrins are other attachment proteins. They allow you to anchor that cell to the basement membrane. So then when you have something going through it, it doesn't just rip the cell away. Other functions, transport, all right? There are three different types, channel proteins, carrier proteins, ATP power pump. These transport proteins are great, right? In that they're very selective. So here, what we're gonna see is if you have a glucose molecule, it can only bind to a glucose receptor. A glucose molecule can't bind to a galactose receptor. It can't bind to a fructose receptor. It can only bind to its own receptor. The problem with this is that if there's too many molecules here, there's a limit to how fast these transport proteins can work. There's a maximum rate at which it works. Now I use an example of going through, if you go to Chicago, right, going through the tollways, right? If you don't have one of those ill eye passes, what happens? Well, if you don't have an eye pass and you have to wait at the tollway, there's only so many stations in the tolls that are open at any one time. So if there's a lot of cars and not a lot of open toll booths, you can be waiting for a long period of time and there'll be a backlog because there's only so fast those people can throw the, right, the actual coins in. It's only so fast that the gate can work to open and close, right? There's a limit to how fast that whole thing can work. So if there's too many people, people starts to back up and now there's a traffic jam at the toll booths. Now, if you have an iPass, you don't need those toll booths. You just go right through, right? What else with the channel proteins? Some are gated, some are not. Non-gated ones means that they're not going to ever, they're gonna always be open, right? That's not good, right? There's, you're not limiting anything, they're always open. The gated ones are the ones that are important in our body. They can be either ligand gated or voltage gated. Now we'll talk about ligand gated one in a lot more detail coming up, right? In chapter seven and eight and nine. Voltage gated ion channels, we'll also talk about in chapter eight and chapter nine. Ligand gated channels opens 
when there's a molecule or a ligand, right? So here we're talking about a neurotransmitter, acetylcholine, epinephrine. When it's available, acetylcholine binds to its channel and opens up a sodium channel, right? A ligand is a very general name for all chemically active molecules. It can be a hormone, it's a type of ligand. A neurotransmitter, it's a type of ligand. It can either be even be an ion as a type of ligand. So ligands are very general, right? Voltage-gated ion channels only open and close in response to small changes in voltage within the cell. We'll talk about these more in chapter nine. So just understand that the gated ion channels are usually closed and only open when there's a ligand or when there's a voltage change. Carrier proteins are also called trans uh, transporters. That's our glucose transporters. It has to bind to a glucose receptor, which is a carrier protein, very specific binding sites. But with the carrier proteins, it follows the rule of diffusion, right? Yes, you might have glucose here. It might bind to the molecule. Right, the receptor. But if there's a lot of glucose inside the cell, it's not going to carry it in. Right? What we're going to see is after you've eaten, there's a lot of glucose outside the cell. The glucose then higher outside the cell, lower inside the cell. Now that glucose molecules will bind to its receptor, and because of the concentration gradient, high on the outside, low on the inside. Because of that, glucose only goes in one direction. It goes inwards into the cell from high to low solute concentration. All right, the last one we'll talk about ATP powered pumps. Now I have a few more slides that discuss this. Again, ATP powered pumps are pumps that requires energy. Why? Simple, these ATP powered pumps, whoops, right here, they're just showing us another example of it. The ATP power pumps, uh, it's pretty far along right there. So, all right here, all right? It's gonna allow three sodiums to be pumped out for every two potassiums being pumped in. Now with our AT powered sodium potassium pumps, right? You're going against the concentration gradient, against it for both sodium and potassium. About 60% of our normal caloric value, greater than half of the calories that we ingest is to run that pump in every cell of our body. That's crazy, isn't it? That small little pump throughout every cell in our body, half of our daily caloric value is used just to run those pumps. That's how important the sodium potassium pump is. Now read the rest of this. I do have videos talking about this and the enzymes and in terms of endocytosis, phagocytosis. So I have videos on those already. Make sure you go out and take a look at those videos.